It's your girl, Natalie, the Keto Bikini Pro. Of course, just back from the gym as usual when it's time for master classes. So tonight is a Tuesday night instead of a Monday because Coach Bronson and I just got back from Arizona. Shout out to my fam out in the West. My girl, Becky and Suzanne, our Quip family. All my peeps out there in Arizona, it was absolutely gorgeous. We got to spend a little bit of time in the mountains, got to go on one hike. Um, definitely want to get back out there and spend more time out there because it was fantastic. The food, y'all, we had some of the best steaks we've had ever. A couple of really great nights of steak. So if you haven't been to Arizona, uh, we spent a little time in Phoenix and... Um, Mm, what's it called? Scottsdale. I was like, not Tempe, not Mesa, Mesa, Mesa. Um, a little bit of all that because it's all right there in the same area, but really enjoyed our time out there. Back home on the East Coast, got back at a little around midnight last night. So settling back in here on the East Coast. And so we rescheduled Monday's masterclass for tonight. So... Thanks for all who are able to join in. Um, glad to have you with us. Glad to see you over there in the chat. Feel free to be chatty, share with each other, share with me, whatever you feel like sharing as we're getting into our topic tonight. So our topic tonight is all about sneaky food labeling and the lies and all of the buzzwords and all of the marketing gimmicks, especially, especially in the low carb space. So uh, we're going to get into some fun stuff tonight, all about food labeling and how to not be fooled by the jargon and the buzzwords and the marketing. Um, as we get into this, I would love to hear in the chat, what are some of the buzzwords that you see all the time that either confuse the heck out of you, you see the buzzword, you, you've gotten fooled by it before, um, or it just frustrates you and to no end when you see these buzzwords. Um, let me know some of the buzzwords that you've seen. Drop those in the chat. Some of those will probably come up tonight. And I will be getting into some of the specifics. Um, but as usual, if you've been around for any of my master classes in the past, you know we talk more about the concepts, more about kind of a 10,000 foot view, how to think about things rather than me giving you all the answers. So there is no possible way I could go through an exhaustive list of absolutely everything you will ever find on a food label. Um, I will address some of the big ones and some of the things to look out for, and we'll get into some of the nitty gritty, um, but I'm not going to go, it, it, there's no way I'll be able to share and explain absolutely everything. So the bigger thing that I want you to take away from tonight's masterclass is how to think about it so that you will not be fooled by labels and you will intelligently know how to read a label, how to understand ingredients, how to know when something is BS marketing and when it's legit. Um, basically, I want you to be able to answer the, your own questions that I get from clients all the time. Is this okay? And usually my question back to the client will be, well, what makes you think it's not okay? And we get into all of that because I want the client to learn for themselves and not be like, would Coach Nat, would this be okay with Coach Nat? because it may be something I wouldn't eat, but maybe it would be okay for you. And so we're gonna talk about kind of the nuances too and how I always, always come back to how to know whether something's right for you or not. Because at the end of the day, two different people could look at two, the same exact food, look at the label, and it might be perfectly fine for one person and absolutely not for another. And that's okay. Um, a big thing I talk about in our community is not being dogmatic, not following food rules just because it's carnivore or it's keto or whatever the label of the diet is. It's not that simple, right? So we want to be able to understand what we're putting in our bodies, 
understand why it may or may not be a good idea to put that in our bodies, not based on what somebody else thinks, but what we know and understand about our own bodies and about the thing that we are about to consume. Okay, so that's what tonight is all about. Um, awesome, we got more and more ladies hopping on. That's awesome. Okay, we got a couple of you have shared your buzzwords that drive you crazy or you've gotten fooled by before. Shannon, all natural. I will be talking about the natural label tonight for sure. That is absolutely going to be something I, I talk about. Juliana, chicken are not vegetarians. <laughs> Dear Eglins, stop bra bragging about feeding them a poor diet. I love that. We will definitely get into eggs. I will be talking about all of the egg labels, all of the different things you might see on an egg label. That is definitely something we will get into, into the nitty gritty tonight. Because I do see people, you know, unsure, what kind of eggs should I buy? What label should I be looking for on my eggs? Um, we will definitely talk about real food labeling and the buzzwords and the things used there when we're talking about meats and eggs and dairy and things of that nature. And then we'll also talk about the packaged food labels, of course. We're going to talk a lot about that. And there, here's another one. Yep. This is going to be a big one we talk about tonight. Net carbs and things labeled as keto, but they have sugar or they have carbs or they have fibers and they have things that, you know, they can subtract to make it keto. Um, but that doesn't mean it's healthy. That doesn't mean it's low carb. That doesn't mean it's not going to impact you or affect you negatively. So, um, Drop in the chat if you haven't yet any other buzzwords you have seen that you would like me to break down today. Anything that confuses you, anything you've seen on a label and you're unsure about, um, drop that in the chat. I'll make sure I cover it um, or anything else that just drives you crazy when you see it on a label or annoys you. <clears throat> okay. Let's get into, I wanted to share some of the comments I saw in the Facebook group when I, uh, Mary Grace posted the question about what you all have seen on labels and what questions you have or things that drive you crazy. Um, here's some of the things I heard in the group. Lies, lies, lies. I swear you have to be a citizen scientist to understand those ingredient lists. Uh, I can't buy anything anymore without checking labels, even if it's something I buy all the time, always uh, changing ingredients and putting crap in it. We're going to talk about that too. Um, at Costco today, my boyfriend saw a baked mackerel. I was expecting some crap oils, but nope, the first ingredient was sugar. Uh, again, all the lies when it says sugar-free, however, they're putting ingredients and changing the names of sugar. We'll talk a little bit about names of sugar and sugar substitutes and sweeteners and things of that nature. Uh, the rules of reporting, we are going to talk about that too. They are allowed plus or minus 20%. If less than a certain amount of fat or carbs, they don't have to report it. Um, they adjust serving size so tiny so they can exploit the rules. Yes, we're going to talk about that for sure. The fact that they lie and change them, change labels. Um, ingredients and total carbs are the only thing I look at anymore. Here's a, here's a real nitty gritty one. Most meat is packaged in a solution and what's in the solution is not on the label. Uh, let's see, cream around here is just milk with vegetable gums. <laughs> that is true. It's very difficult to find pure cream that doesn't have stabilizers added to it. Shredded cheese has, R, has an RX that needs a prescription. Um, natamycin and cellulose, which basically round, are ground up trees. I drive my husband crazy because I'm a big label reader. Permission to drive anyone around you crazy because I would rather know what I'm consuming and what I'm putting in my body. So you all have permission to drive the people in your life crazy with how you read labels and how much you care about what goes into your vessel. We're gonna talk about that too. And then I find it really frustrating that they don't require certain things to be labeled in this country. For instance, ingredients with ingredients, unless they're one of the top nine allergens. For me, it gets personal. In other countries, gluten must be labeled almost like an allergen. Here, they are only required to label wheat, so labels can include miscellaneous ingredients that contain barley or rye, which 
are gluten great, gluten containing grains, and they aren't clearly labeled. Malt and brewer's yeast are almost always gluten, and there are a, a slew of other ones that may or may not be. So yeah, for my gluten sensitive people, oh boy, that's a whole other rabbit hole, right? So, all right, uh, that's a lot of stuff, and we're going to talk about a lot of that and a lot more. So um, first things first, though, let's get into Bronson's favorite statement, principles over protocols. So rather than me saying, here's the list of ingredients on a label that's Coach Nat approved or Keto Bikini Body approved, right? It's more about you figuring out what suits you, what fits you. Um, is this healthy and is this not? So I'm going to teach you a little bit tonight about how to think about whether something is healthy in general and whether it's healthy for you. Just because things are labeled a certain way does not make them automatically healthy. Um, and just because they're a certain brand does not make them automatically healthy. Um, so first things first, the principles. You are in control of what you buy and what you choose to put into your body at all times. I'm going to say that again. You are in control of what you purchase and what you choose to put into your body at all times. There is never a time in your life ever that you ever need to put anything into your body that you do not want to have in your body. If you are at a cookout, if you are at a potluck, if you are at a restaurant, if you are at somebody else's house and they are serving you food, you can ask what's in the food and you can say no. It's always an option. Sometimes it's easier than other times. Sometimes you're tempted. Sometimes you don't want to feel weird or different. You don't want to uh, put anybody else by, out by asking. But I know Erin, for example, with celiac, she better ask. She better ask. For those of you with peanut allergies, real hyperphylaxis, what is it? Uh, true allergies where you will go into hyperphylaxis. Am I saying that right? <laughs> you will not be able to breathe. Your, your throat will close. You better ask if something has peanuts in it or whatever the true allergen is, right? People with true allergies wouldn't think twice about asking and making sure they know before it goes into their body. So before we get into all the labeling stuff, anaphylaxis. Thank you, Juliana. I knew Juliana would have my back. She always does. Um, <laughs> thanks, Deb. I love y'all. I was like, what is that term? Anaphylactic shock, right? So you have to treat it like that. When you are choosing a certain lifestyle, choosing a certain diet, you've got to take a step back and say, forget about the weight loss goals or whatever my body goals are. Why did I choose this in the first place? Because there's a, I always say this. I always say this in my academy with my clients. I can get you body composition results on any chosen way of eating. So why did you choose keto? Why did you choose carnivore? Because it goes beyond the weight loss. And if you don't have a reason beyond the weight loss, you need to find one. Get into the community because you will hear all the stories and that can help you determine why else you have chosen this diet. Because I'll tell you what, if you hate a diet and you're only doing it for weight loss, you're not gonna be doing it for long and you're not gonna keep the weight loss for long. So I digress. Of course, I have to say that, right? So when you're on a health and fitness journey, you must care about what you are consuming, especially a health and fitness journey. It's not just a fitness journey. On a fitness journey, you could get away with a lot in terms of your diet, okay? You can, you can get fit through training, through training modalities, exercise, without worrying about what you put in your body. But you can only get so fit doing that. The nutrition pairs with the training to get you the health and the fitness benefits. So you've got to determine if you, are, if you care about your health and fitness, you must care about what you're putting in your body. So that requires you to act 
differently than you did when you didn't care. Most of us on this journey have not been on this journey our entire lives. We had a period of time where we didn't give a crap what we were putting in our bodies. It was wings this night, pizza that night, tacos that night. It was ice cream whenever we wanted it. Oh, there's donuts in the break room. Let's go for it. Maybe we were drinking 800 calorie sugar coffees from Starbucks, whatever it might be, right? You didn't think at all about health and fitness. You were thinking about what would taste good to me right now. And then you decided to go on a health and fitness journey. And guess what? That had to change. That required you to now think differently about what you're getting ready to put in your body. <laughs> yes. Gluten-free coach. Aaron says, that's all so true. Two Snickers from the vending machine, right? It was, it was like, hmm, what, what would taste good right now? That was the only criteria you had when you didn't care. The moment you decided you, you cared about what you were eating because you cared about results you were trying to get, you had to start keep thinking differently about what you were choosing. I love this. Ha ha, donuts in the break room. Yeah. <laughs> it still happens, right? It, it was still happening throughout my whole journey when I was working in a nine, a nine to five in an office environment. We always had stuff in the break room. We were a nonprofit, so we got things donated. We got we had board members bringing stuff in. It was constant. I could have had an excuse every day to eat that stuff. But I had to think differently. Ah, preach. Yes, every day is someone's birthday. Exactly. Exactly. Imagine, just think about the number of times a year that you would eat that crap if you just allowed yourself every single time. Count them up. What would that look like? Imagine how many pounds of excess body fat that would be at the end of the year if every opportunity you got, you took. All right, so let's get back to the topic, right? <laughs> so here's the number one rule. The number one rule is never buy or consume anything without understanding what is in it. And that is not always as simple as it seems, but it doesn't give you an excuse not to, not to understand what's in it. Hey, Courtney Luna's in the house. What up, girl? <laughs> so glad to have you with us. We are talking about food labeling lies. I'm sure you are very well versed in this, my love. So here's the deal. Never buy anything or consume anything without understanding what's in it. What does this mean? It means learn better so you can do better. That's number one. So I'm glad you are here on this masterclass because this is part of learning better, learning what these labels mean, learning what the buzzwords, what's behind the buzzwords, learning how to not be fooled by labels. So first, learn, educate yourself. Second, read and or inquire about what's in it. I say read first because if you're the one purchasing it, read what's in front of you, read what's on the label, not just the front of the package, the back of the package, not just the numbers and the nutrition label, but the ingredients. Read between the lines. And if you're somewhere where you can't read because you're, you're ordering from a, a menu at a restaurant, read the menu. If it doesn't say on the menu, ask. This is why I say read and or inquire. Inquire with the wait staff. Inquire with the chef. Inquire with your friend who cooked it if you're at somebody's house and they're cooking for you. Either ask in advance or ask right then and there what's in it as if you had a true allergy and your throat would close. Treat every opportunity, every time you're putting food in your, in your mouth, treat it like that. I need to know what's in this because it matters. Number three, look it up if it's not apparent, if it is not clear on the label, if you're reading the ingredients and you don't know what they are, Google it. I have had my phone in a grocery store before First, if I didn't, if they didn't have the macros on the label, they didn't have a nutrition label, a lot of real foods don't, and I mostly buy real foods, which we'll get into in a minute. I have pulled up my chronometer app right there in the grocery store and looked up 
the London broil to see what it said for the macros. So I knew about the macros, but it is so much farther beyond the macros, understanding what's in it. If you see a pre-cooked, pre-seasoned piece of meat at the grocery store, and it doesn't list all the ingredients that are in it, you can go to the counter and you can ask them. Okay, well, that's one thing I love about Whole Foods. I love to use their hot bar or their pre-cooked meals because they will put every single ingredient on that label and you will know what it's cooked with. And they have paleo options that are usually just olive oil, salt, and pepper. So that's one of my go-tos. Later this month, I've decided our final masterclass this month will be all about dining on the go. So my tips and tricks for what to do when you are out and about and you need something quick, fast food, restaurants, grocery stores, gas stations, all that good stuff. So we're going to go into that later this month. But look it up if it's not apparent. If you see an ingredient and you've never heard of that ingredient before, Google it. There's no excuse these days for not having information. We can easily get information. If you don't know what this is, look it up. If you're not sure, is this good or bad? Is this a bad thing? Is this maybe a vitamin or a mineral? Or is this something I need to be you know, worried about? Look it up. You're going to be able to get information about it. And then if you look it up and you still don't know, that's when, if you're working with me, just send me a message and I will let you know my thoughts. But the first thing, and Juliana can tell you, the first thing I'm going to say to you, or what, are you, what do you think? I'm going to put it back on you because I want you to think about it and I want you to come to your own conclusions and tell me what you think rather than always relying on somebody else to tell you what they think or whether or not it's good. Okay? So. No, no this is Masterclass. Oh, I'm Masterclass. <laughs> We're talking about food labeling lies. Huh? What did you do? What? What did you do? I did my hair. He's going to make me blush, y'all. This is what happens when he stares at me. <laughs> bon appetit. Okay, so back to the topic. I'm getting all blushed. Um, okay, so the, the number one rule, again, never buy or consume anything without understanding what's in it. It's not always as simple as it seems, but that doesn't give you an excuse not to do the four things. I haven't even said number four yet. One, learn better so you can do better. Educate yourself. Two, read and or inquire about what's in it. Three, look it up if it's not apparent or if you're not familiar with it. And number four, have the confidence to put it back or say no if it is not up to your standards. And we're going to get into a little bit of how you determine what your standards are, because like I said, two different people could have different standards. They could both be in the low carb space. They can both be on this journey, but one cares more about one thing and one cares more about another. I don't eat dairy. So for me, if there's dairy on the label, it's going to be a no. For somebody else, absolutely might not be the case. Now I'm going to get a little bit into the non-dairy things and the things you need to worry about or look out for on non-dairy products because there's a whole bunch of non-dairy products I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole, um, but somebody else might. So we'll talk about that. All right. And then finally, do not rely on trusted brands mm -hmm. because things can change. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that was brought up in the Facebook group. Can't stand it when a brand that I love and I thought I trusted and had all these products that I used all of a sudden changed something. And now there's ingredients in there that there weren't in before that wasn't in there before. So that stuff can happen. So don't just think because it's XYZ brand and you've bought this other thing from them forever and they came out with this new thing that it's not potentially something that could not be on your standards list. So always, always read labels. Um, every single time. And this was, Lori said this in the group, I can't buy anything anymore without checking labels, <clears throat> even if it's something I buy all the time. Yeah, sorry. It's a little bit more inconvenient, but if you had an allergy, what would you do? Okay, Bronson likes to say when we go out to eat and that when they ask if there's any allergies or any um, food uh, preferences, he says, I'm allergic to vegetables and I'm allergic to vegetable oils. 
So yeah, that's the way you got to treat it, right? I'm allergic to carbs, whatever it might be. I'm allergic to dairy. You have to treat it that way. All right. And then one more piece of tough love before we get into the nitty gritties. Once you have learned your lesson, i.e. XYZ ingredient causes inflammation, causes me gut troubles, causes me to go off the rails or causes me, triggers me to eat sugar or causes XYZ setback for me. Make a different choice next time. You have learned your lesson once. Don't keep learning your lesson again and again and again and again. If you really learned it, you wouldn't do it again. So the next time you do it again, you need to think about that. I have seen this many times. Uh, usually it was years ago when I was coaching in a different program and I would get check-ins. Well, now I know, now I know better. I'm like, yeah, you said that the last, you said that four weeks ago when you did the exact same thing. So you knew and then you conveniently forgot and then now you're learning your lesson again. So learn your lesson and then let it help make a different decision next time. I know that that thing bothers me, so I'm not gonna go eat that thing again. And y'all, look, it's not that there's anything wrong with you, okay? Our limbic brain is always playing these games with us, trying to get us to do the old patterns, the old default patterns from when we weren't healthy. And we have, most of us have decades of those patterns and habits and thought processes built in for decades. And then now maybe we've been doing this for a few months or a few years, but it's nothing compared to the decades we had prior. So don't beat yourself up when these things happen. Just recognize, check into your thoughts, identify that sneaky limbic brain that's trying to trick you by making excuses to justify it, even though you know better. So be the adult and put your foot, your foot down like you would with a child throwing a tantrum because that's what's happening. This limbic brain, this monkey brain, lizard brain, whatever you want to call it, it's throwing a tantrum. But we really like this thing, remember? Yeah, but our body doesn't like it. So that's going to be a no for me. Okay? Be your own Simon Cowell. <laughs> Juliana, sunflower oil is the devil. Yes, read the labels, y'all. And then when you see it on there, you cannot play, you cannot plead ignorance. A lot of the time, because, oh, that thing looks good. I'm just not going to look because it's better not to know. And then days later, achy joints, headaches, whatever it might be, because it, it manifests differently for different people. Okay, so draw your own lines in the sand. What will you allow and what will you not allow? As, you, as we talk about the things tonight, you can kind of start to build your list. Think about it. What's worth it to you and what's not? Um, the biggest thing for you is going to be, I, like I say to my ladies, um, becoming an investigator and observing your body's responses to things. Um, the way we do it is with our check-ins. We do our biofeedback and it really helps um, identify things that we may not have ever noticed before about how our body reacts to things. So pay attention to your triggers. Um, no one else's. What's okay for someone else may not be okay for you and vice versa. All right. So as we talk about owning your journey, let's get educated. All right. First things at first, first lesson tonight. Rule of thumb is always buy ingredients, not products with ingredients. So first things first, as much as possible, whenever possible, avoid anything that even has a label on it. Aside from if you're buying your real foods in the grocery store, a lot of them, they have to have some sort of processing to get to the grocery store. And so if you're not buying it directly from the farmer, and even then they probably have some sort of label on it. But what I mean is whole, real, minimally processed foods as close to their natural state as possible. Your meats, your dairy, your fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, if you're eating fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. 
This might mean raw, soaked, sprouted nuts and seeds and not roasted with sunflower oil and maltodextrin and dextrose and who knows whatever else they're putting on it. And this also may include avoiding pepperoni, salami, bologna, hot dogs, and other processed meats where they're adding a bunch of crap to it as well. So we're talking about a hunk of meat, a chuck roast, a lamb leg, steaks. I just bought Bronson 11 pounds of meat, six pounds of turkey. It's not all gonna fit in there. We'll just do half of each. It's six pounds of turkey and five pounds of ground beef. Um, so buying things as close to their natural state as possible, minimally processed. It may have a label on it because you're buying it from a grocery store. But if you focus on that first, it will eliminate the majority of the issues with food labeling. Um, and it'll eliminate more of the work that it takes on your part to ensure you're getting what you think you're getting. Um, but it doesn't eliminate all of the labeling lies and marketing jargon. So let's get first into real food labeling. So the kinds of things you might see on a whole real food product. Um, <laughs> do what? Nothing. I wish. All right, so some big buzzwords here. Organic. There's organic labeling for meats, for pretty much everything. <laughs> meats, produce, dairy, yeah, dairy too, right? Pretty much everything, anything can have an organic label. Does that mean it's necessarily healthier? In some cases, it can. In other cases, not so much. What do I mean by that? If we're talking big food, I like to avoid Purdue. Uh, what's the what's the pork one? Pork? The big company. Y'all would probably know it in the uh, y'all drop it uh, in the chat. Um, I've got the label in my head. Right. Green and red and white. What's the what's the big pork company, y'all? There's a Hormel, but that's not the that's one. There's another one, Tyson, Tyson, Smithfield. That was the one, Smithfield, yeah. So I tend to avoid all of those, yes, ConAgra brands. Oh, here we go. Ah. Monsanto. I'm trying to get the light to stay on and it's flickering. Are you tripping light? All right, we'll just go with that, that's fine. So yeah, the big, the big, yeah, the big meat companies, I try to avoid those as much as possible. Um, but when you're talking like a small local family farm, they may not be labeled organic because there are a lot of hoops they have to jump through to be able to get that organic label put on their foods. So they may not have the funds. They may just simply not have the funds to be able to do it. Um, so I would say local small business farmers. The best thing you can possibly do, and that's something I'll be looking into now that we're settled here uh, in Virginia, is looking at local farms where we can buy direct, where we can get to know the farmer and actually ask them and go tour the farm. This would be the best case scenario. If we're talking good, better, best, this is the best case scenario, getting to know your local farmers and really developing a relationship and being able to ask them all the questions you wanna ask them about how the animals are raised, what they feed them, where they're kept, the conditions, all that good stuff. That would be ideal, right? Pick your pig Friday. Pick your pig Friday, that would be fun. Um, I love it, Juliana, ask to see the cows. If you cannot tour it, don't eat it. That's awesome. I don't want to get into an accident. Be careful. See you later. Time for him to go to the gym. So, uh, she says, small farmers can be just as bad. They are the ones who will not invite you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, 
ultimately what it comes down to is, you know, organic doesn't necessarily mean healthier. Don't they make organic Oreos now? It's ridiculous. They can put organic on anything. Um, so organic doesn't necessarily mean healthier. So just don't be fooled when you see an organic label and think that that means it's, it's automatically better. Um, there are humane certifications. Um, there are labels specifically, there's animal welfare approved. There's global animal partnership. They have a gap step reading. There's certified humane. So there's things like that where you can look at um, really trying to find meats that are raised, the animals are raised in a healthy, in healthy conditions. Um, because when they're raised in poor conditions, that's what leads to most of the problems that we have with the unhealthy meat. Um, and that's why a lot of those big food companies where they're factory farmed, they're in terrible conditions. Um, so I would say you could look for humane certifications, but even then too, like I said, the smaller farmers may not be able to get these kinds of ratings. So um, best thing to do is looking for a local farm where you can really get to know them. Um, ooh, Christina says, I have a local rancher that we get a half beef from. They, yeah, that's amazing. When you can get like a quarter cow, a half cow, split it with other families, um, that kind of stuff is amazing. Um, now there's also great companies out there where you can order you know, your meats and have them delivered from all over the country and they source the meats. And once again, you would have to do your research. So don't just think because it's one of these, you know, butcher box or, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting all those different meat company names now. There's plenty of them. Um, drop your favorite one if you order your meats from one of those companies, drop your favorite one in the comments. Maria Emmerich was just telling us about a great one, I think I still have it in here, that I had not heard of before. Real Ranch. RealRanchGrassFed.com. Not your backyard beef. So, yeah, that was per Maria Emmerich. So um, I kept them up here on my browser so I can check them out. So... That would be ideal. Let's move on so I don't spend all night talking about that. But um, when you're shopping at the grocery store, when we're talking about meats, best case scenario in a grocery store environment, grass-fed, grass-finished. That's going to be a lot harder to find the grass-fed, 100% grass-fed and finished. Um, sometimes you're not going to find the finished, but you'll find some grass-fed. That would still be a better choice than your um, conventional, but even if, if all you can get and budget is limited, conventional meat, is not necessarily the worst thing, especially when you're getting not the processed meats, those, like I said, the hot dogs and the salami and the pepperoni and all the things that have all the other crap in it. Um, so Look for grass for grass finish if you can afford it, work it into your budget. Um, I, like I said, I used to do all grass fed and I switched to now I do a mix um, because it's just more budget friendly. Um, pasture raised is another great label to look for when it comes to uh, animals that were fed, had pasture, pastured or pasture raised. They actually got out on the pasture. We're going to talk about that in a moment when I get to the eggs. Um, but that's kind of another good label to look for. When it comes to your seafood, yes, for the most part, most of the time, wild caught is going to be better than farm raised. But in some cases, like salmon, for example, farm raised is not necessarily the worst. Um, but Always, I try to always go for wild caught whenever possible. And certainly for your shrimp, for example, which are more of the bottom feeders. I think we talked about that on a previous masterclass. All right, let's get into eggs because I really want to get into the egg labels. There are some interesting egg labels. So we've got Cage-free, free-range, pasture-raised, vegetarian-fed, omega-3. There's like on and on and on with all of these egg labels. Ideal, if we're talking top of the food chain, best, best eggs to purchase, pasture-raised. 
cage free just means they could be in a pen like this all stuffed in never see the light of day but they're not in cages that's all cage free means so cage free is probably like the bottom of the barrel when you're looking for i mean the bottom of the barrel would just be eggs that don't have any label at all because they're probably factory farmed in cages eating their own feces it's not a not a great environment to be in um cage free is like one step up but it's right there like they just they're just not in cages but they can still be in very tight living quarters and it can be nasty free range is going to be the next step up so they've gotten out of, out of the pens at some point in time that's not guaranteed that they got any kind of pasture that they got to go out and eat anything off of the land which is what chickens do um most of the time that cage free and free range they're probably still being fed grains and grain grain feed um but if they are pasture raised this is going to be the best case scenario that means they actually got some time on pasture they actually got out there and ate the bugs which is what they're supposed to do and as Mary, uh, as juliana mentioned earlier vegetarian fed is not what you want when it says vegetarian fed that means they're being fed grains and whatever they're putting in the grain mixtures chickens are not vegetarians they do not need to be vegetarian fed um Matter of fact, we don't want them to be because it's more natural for them to be able to live on the pasture and eat on the pasture. Okay. So um, omega-3 just means it's been fortified with more omega-3s. This could be in the form of the feed, the way that they're feeding the chickens. So once again, that could be a sign that they're actually, it, it's in the chicken feed and that may not be a great option either. Once again, you all you have to take all of this in with your budget, right? For for a while there, we were just buying the cheapest thing we could find at Aldi. Um, still, it's real food. It's still a better choice than your processed packaged crap, right? Um, but when we're talking about the hierarchy, if you're trying to look at the labels and understand what these things mean, that's what I'm explaining here. So pasture raise is going to be better than your free range, free range better than your cage free that kind of a thing. Do, do, do. There are certain brands I like too, but once again, I don't just rely on that. Um, Vital Farms is one of our favorites. I think since we're just talking about Maria, we just talked about Vital Farms the other night too. That's where she gets all her eggs whenever she can help it. Happy Egg Company is another one I like. Um, once again, that's another great thing to get from a local farmer. And some of y'all raise your own chickens, and that's even better because then you can completely control everything. And you have them right there, which is pretty amazing. I would like to have chickens one day. All right, let's see. Let's dive into the buzzwords and packaged products. Um, and let me know if you have questions about any other real food labels. I know sometimes um, there's the whole non-GMO thing that's really gonna apply more to produce. So if you're carnivore, it's not really something you're gonna have to think about, um, but produce, you know, you're gonna have some things labeled non-GMO. Um, basically, if it's not labeled, it's probably GMO because they're going to get away with it. They don't want to tell you. They're, certain, they're not required to tell you um, if it's GMO or not. Some people care more about that than others. I would probably care more about it being organic when it comes to produce than it being uh, non-GMO. Most things are GMO these days. Genetically modified organism, if you didn't know what that means, by the way. Ooh, Natalie, I want to come visit you. She says, my husband and son hunt and fish a lot and venison, moose and deer and fish in my freezer all year long. Heck yeah. I love that. I love the sound of that. All right, let's get into these uh, things that really chap my hide. 
Oh, the packaged products. So always best case scenario, you just avoid anything that's in, in a box uh, with a label on it with a bunch of ingredients. But I know that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes you want to get some packaged stuff. So the biggest thing that drives me crazy is the whole keto labeling. <sighs> Net carb products that are labeled as keto, keto breads, keto tortillas, traditionally high carb foods that are labeled as keto. They are labeled that way because they are adding fibers to the product so that they can subtract the fiber from the total carbs and tell you that it has one net carb or zero net carbs or two net carbs or five net carbs or whatever the heck. That is my biggest <clears throat> pet peeve in the space. Most keto label products are not actually low carb at all. If you look at the total carbs in those products, they sometimes get over 30, 40, 50 total carbs. So that's, that's my big frustration. Um, <clears throat> and for those who do not know, net carbs simply means Total carbs minus fiber, minus these days, sugar alcohols and other kinds of non-nutritive sweeteners. Um, they can subtract all of that from the total carbs so they can report net carbs. This is one of the reasons why in my group, we track total carbs because I want you to know what your total carbs are. It's okay to look at net carbs as well, but we need to know everything. We need to be aware. So track total carbs, look at these products as total carbs. I don't care what it says on the label about it being keto. I never trust a keto label. As a matter of fact, I avoid most things or all things that say keto on them. I just always know that that's going to be some BS. We already talked about organic, so I won't get into that, but it certainly doesn't really mean much. Natural, all natural means absolutely nothing. It is not a term that is regulated at all. There's no regulation for the term natural. So that means nothing. When you see natural on a product, just ignore it. it it's not giving you any information. Gluten-free can be very helpful for people with celiac who do want to explore uh, traditionally products that traditionally have gluten in them, and they want a substitute that does not have gluten in them. So um, as Erin was saying, we, a lot of products don't have to label that way. So actually looking at the label gluten-free, if you do have celiac or you do have a gluten sensitivity, is a good opportunity if you do want to go, you know, you're looking for a substitute product. Um, in general, I would say most things, in my opinion, that have a gluten-free label are not a kind of food I would want to put in my body anyway. And they usually put a bunch of crap in those products to replace and to kind of try to recreate the texture and flavor and, and all of the things that you get with a gluten product. So most of the time, if it is a, if it is labeled gluten-free, it's a product that I'd rather not have in the first place. Um, Grain-free would be, in my opinion, a, a better choice. So it's kind of like the eggs. I would say, you know, going from gluten-free to grain-free would be my next best option um, because I don't want even non-gluten grains. Um, now, if you are consu consuming grains that are not gluten, um, that are non-gluten grains, and you can handle that, and that's a part of your journey and a part of your standards, then gluten-free may be a good uh, label for you. Yes, uh, this right here. Some are better than others, but a lot are worse than the gluten-containing products. Make it yourself. Truth. Yes, ma'am. Most of the time, if I want to do anything that's a conventional standard American treat, I don't even like to call them treats, but junk food, I would much rather just make my own. And it's a good stopgap because most of the time I'm not going to put in the, the work and the time to make my own, so then I'm just not going to eat it at all. 
Oh yeah, this is another thing I wanted to mention. I'm so glad you brought this up, Erin. Wegmans labels all of their brand, their brand whole food products as gluten-free. I always get a chickle out of that. And that's the thing, y'all, there are all those whole food, real food products, foods, ingredients, <laughs> are naturally gluten-free. And you see when, when the whole celiac thing really became popular, um, became more well-known and gluten became more of a well-known thing, th companies started putting gluten-free on stuff that was always gluten-free. Apples are always gluten-free, you know, um, peanut butter should be gluten-free, things like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, I don't know if we're talking about peanut butter specifically, but peanut butter is a product that is notorious for having things in it. So you need to be reading those labels for sure. Um, all right. I wanted to say something about the dairy free stuff because y'all know, look, I've been dairy free longer than I've been keto longer than I've been low carb. All right. Like 13 years, maybe more now dairy free. There have been a lot of things that have come out over the years that are dairy-free, and a lot of them are pure garbage. It's just as bad as the fake meats out there. The fake cheeses are absolutely horrendous to your gut, and the kinds of things that they're putting in there are just horrible. So most dairy-free products, I, I haven't had a, a dairy-free cheese in a million, I don't remember the last time I had one. Um, I used to actually like the Daya when I first went dairy-free, but it is full of fibers and um, peas, I think, pea protein, probably all kinds of crap. So I don't even remember. It was a very long list of ingredients. But in general, I avoid most dairy-free products. The only thing that I really lean into that is dairy-free is coconut, pure coconut products, for my coffee, coconut yogurt, coconut milk. I'm not a big fan of almond milks. I'm not a big fan of most nut milks. Um, most people, a lot of people are, who are sensitive to dairy are also sensitive to nuts. So a lot of that stuff is still gonna be reactive for you. Um, but what I would say there is to look for replacements that are one ingredient, maybe two ingredients, almonds and water, coconut and water, um, coconut milk, coconut cream, and water. The actual thing. So there's, um, we were just talking about a brand. I forget the name of the brand. Elk something that is just the nut and water. So it's, they've got, I don't remember if they have the, they have a pecan one, but they have macadamia and walnut and hazelnut milk. They have like all these different kinds. Um, those that, that brand is just nut and that nut and water. Um, you can make your own. You can make your own nut milks or coconut milk by just taking the coconut and blending it with water and then straining it. You can do the same thing with hazelnuts, walnuts, pecans, almonds, macadamia nuts. You can definitely make your own. Um, the other thing with dairy-free, when you see the lactose-free products, so these are dairy products like yogurt, milk, uh, cheese. If they say lactose free, most of the time, if you read the label, you will see in the ingredients, there is something called lactase enzyme in there. That product is not lactose free. That product has lactose in it. It is a, it is a, pro, it is a product that naturally has lactose, but they have added a lactase enzyme so that you can break down the lactose. For some people who are sensitive, that is still not going to help. So be aware that when it says lactose free, it doesn't mean that they've removed the lactose from the milk or the cheese or the yogurt. In many cases with yogurt and probiotic products like yogurt, the probiotics have actually consumed the lactose. So there may be very minimal amounts of lactose left. Um, whey products, similar, very little lactose left. But in my experience, at least for myself and many people that I know who have problems with dairy, it's not necessarily a lactose problem. A lot of people have problems with the casein, and that's the protein in the dairies. 
Uh, the, so that may not help. So don't just assume that if you have a dairy problem that it's a lactose thing and go and buy a bunch of lactose-free products, especially without reading the labels. Um, okay, I just wanted to mention a couple of other buzzwords and kind of health foods or things labeled as health foods or marketed as health foods. Protein or high protein products. You might see peanut butters and nut butters that, I saw Justin's peanut butter did this recently. Protein, they, they just put protein on their peanut butter label. And I was like, oh, are they adding protein to their peanut butter? I looked at the label, it's the exact same as their regular product but they put protein and they put the number of grams of protein that it has on the front. But they put it really, they put protein really big. So it looks like they made a protein peanut butter. Yes, Erin knows a whopping seven grams of protein, right? It's just the same exact product, but they're like, oh, because my product has protein, I can market it this way and make the word protein really big. And then you think that it's like this high protein product. When the, the truth is peanut butter, y'all, Peanut butter is not a source of protein. I need to tell this to the bodybuilding community. A lot of people think, oh, I eat lots of protein. I make a smoothie with peanut butter. It is fat. It is primarily a fat product. It is like a whole bunch of fat with a little bit of protein and some carbs. And most nuts are high fat, may have some carbs and have a little bit of protein. So don't get fooled by that. If something is labeled as a protein product, look at the product. And I will say most protein products, meaning they have added protein powders to the product to make it a higher protein content, most of the time it's garbage. Turn that over. Usually it's going to have higher fat and carbs than it even does protein. All protein bars, it's very rare that you will find, I don't think there are any out there at all actually, any protein bars that actually have higher protein than fuel, fats or carbs or both. If you, if you look at the fats and carbs versus the protein, all of those protein bars are going to be really high fats and carbs and or carbs. And protein will be like 12 grams, 20 grams, maybe at the most. So don't get fooled by that. I will say probably the safest bet there would be high protein yogurts. You can actually get some really great high protein yogurts that are like 20 grams of protein and minimal fats and carbs, but you've got to look closely because those can be tricky. And a lot of the time, um, the low carb or low sugar yogurts are actually not as good as the original. Faye is a great example, Faye uh, Greek yogurts. Their original regular Greek yogurts only have, I want to say five grams of carbs at the most. If you go and get the um, low sugar ones, uh, the Chobani makes them now too good. They're adding things to that product. That's now it's not just Greek yogurt and cultures and probiotic cultures. It's now got fibers or sweeteners or all of that. So in that case, I would say most of the time doing the, the raw or the plain Greek yogurt and then adding your own sweeteners, which I like to just do the liquid stevia or the liquid monk fruit extract, not the granulated stuff. Um, or I just add protein powder and make my own. I do that with coconut yogurt because I don't do the, the dairy yogurt. But I would absolutely do more. Just go with the plain, uh, unflavored, unsweetened, not trying to cater to the low sugar community because they're always going to add stuff in there to make up for the lack of sugar. Um, but some of those pure plain Greek yogurts are actually pretty decent. So that's the other thing, kind of my rule of thumb is just to always go with what's the most natural. Have they needed to add things to make this product or is this in as close to its natural state as possible? Um, Superfood and adaptogenic and adaptogens and probiotics and prebiotics. I would just, I'll put all that in the same category with all of the biohacking and the health buzzwords. All of that, I would just say, doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Don't run out and buy this stuff because it's a superfood or it has adaptogens in it, or they've added probiotics or prebiotics to it. Um, 
If you want probiotics, get some fermented real sauerkraut. Like in the refrigerated section, look at the ingredients. It's just the cabbage and salt, not even with the vinegar. That's the real stuff. And you can, that's another thing you can make yourself. You can make your own fermented um, vegetables. You can make your own fermented, you can make your own yogurts. So those kinds of things, just don't go out and get it because it says they have probiotics in it. It doesn't make it healthy. All right. So next up, and let me know if there's any other buzzwords I haven't touched on, and I'm happy to chat about those too. But there's so many now in the in the health food space. You'll just if you go into the health food section of the grocery store, you'll see all kinds of labels, all kinds of crazy stuff. Most of it is just trying to trick you into buying a more expensive product that you could probably actually get cheaper. And matter of fact, I think Aaron was just saying that about Faye, um, the store brand. A lot of the time, the store brand is not necessarily a worse product. You know, it's just that you have to pay for the branding when you're paying for these, these big companies. Um, all right, let's talk about nutrition labels, meaning the nutrition label with the numbers on it versus the ingredient labels. Always, 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 always read the ingredient label. Don't just look at the numbers. And if you are looking at the numbers, remember to look at total carbs and calories because all those, that stuff matters. Now here's uh, what Deb was mentioning in the group. They are allowed for their numbers to be off by up to 20%. So you could be reading the label and be like, oh, these macros look good. It may not jive. So when you put it into your, your tracker, you might be like, I hear this all the time in the group. Why do my calories not match my macros? I'm, I hit my macros. I'm a little bit under my macros, but I'm way over on my calories or I'm under on my calories or why isn't it matching up? And a lot of the time that points to the fact that these labels, they're actually getting away with something. They're going to try to make their product look like it's lower calorie. So You'll see this with the keto products. They might only put the calories for the net carbs and not the total carbs. Or um, if it has allulose in it, a lot of the time they don't list it at all as a carb. Or it'll be included in the total carbs, but it won't show up as a fiber. And that can be very confusing. And they may skew their calories based on that. Um, I know for pork rinds, for those of you who love pork rinds, their, their portion size, 14 grams. Try measuring out 14 grams of pork rinds and see how much that is. So when you see the number on the label, it looks like it's this, oh, 100 calorie snack. Yeah, for 14 grams. How many of y'all are only eating 14 grams, half an ounce of pork rinds when you eat those? If you eat the whole bag, that's going to be 500 plus calories. And then what else do I see this with the calories, uh, the, the lies with the calories um, or the labeling? Uh, there's another one that's kind of notorious for this and I'm forgetting what it is now. Darn, hopefully it'll come back to me. But just say, look beyond the numbers. That is a big piece of the puzzle, look beyond the numbers. Yes, 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 yes. Bliss says that happens all the time with Fitbit. And when I looked into it, the advice was essentially saying, don't trust the labels because they don't always add up. Yep. And this is why one of the things that we say is, okay, focus on the macros, because if you're hitting and nailing your macros, the calories will fall where the calories are meant to fall. So we focus on macros more than we focus on calories. It's just kind of a check and balance kind of a thing. All right, let's talk about some common ingredients that you will see on labels. Um, and how bad are these really? Um, so sugar and sugar substitutes, of course, there are like a million different names for sugar. Usually, so we got sugar and sugar substitutes. So dextrose, maltodextrin, um, anything usually when you see corn, 
syrup solids. Um, oh my gosh, any any rice syrup, anytime you see syrup, there's there's lots and lots. You can Google it. It's so easy to find now. List of names of sugars, and you will find like a hundred different names of sugars or more. Um, so there is so much, so much that's sugar that you may not know is sugar. And then all of the sugar alcohols, um, maltose, dextrose, anytime you see os at the end of it, or malatol, um, tall at the end of it, os at the end of it usually means it's some sort of sugar or sugar substitute. Um, and then we have natural and artificial sweeteners. So we've got all the artificial ones. And then let me just clarify, because some people talk about stevia and monk fruit like they are artificial sweeteners. They are not artificial. They are natural. They are still sweeteners, but they are natural sweeteners. Um, but for some people, some people react to Stevia, a lot of people I'm, I'm learning, Stevia impacts a lot of people in different ways. Um, monk fruit usually doesn't impact people as much as Stevia does. Um, but one big thing I wanna mention here, whether it is a sugar, a real sugar, natural sugar, a sugar substitute, um, a sugar alcohol, a, uh, a non-nutritive sweetener, artificial or natural, whatever it is, the most important thing is not necessarily whether or not it spikes blood glucose. Because I see in the keto space, most people are like, the only reason they're concerned about it is whether or not it spikes glucose. And we have all of these people, blood glucose, I mean, we have all these people out there, especially in the fitness industry, which it drives me crazy to see, oh, studies say that this doesn't spike your blood glucose, so it's not a problem, right? Especially when they're talking about diet sodas and things of that nature. I always like to pull it back to wait, let's think about the lifestyle, the habits, the mindset, right? If it is causing you to then go, if it's the gateway drug that causes you then go and consume more and more and more sweet, that's a problem for you. That may not be a problem for somebody else. If it causes you gut troubles, that is a problem for you. It may not be a problem for someone else. If it causes you any other kinds of, of issues. For me, maltodextrin and sucralose. Massive immediate headache. Used to be maltodextrin would cause cravings. I don't get that so much anymore, but the headache is like immediate. And erythritol and all the sugar alcohols, xylitol, malitol, sorbitol, that is, a, that is usually gut troubles for me. Um, some people do fine on allulose. Some people do not. Even the smallest amount will cause gut troubles or other things. Um, so you need to determine for you. This is one of those things, the sugar and the sugar substitutes and the sweeteners. This is a big thing where you need to determine for you what is acceptable for you and what is not. What is on your list of standards and what is not. And then once you identify that, this is a big one where a lot of people make the, you know, keep going back to it, even though they've learned their lesson, because it's like, well, let me try it now. Maybe now it's not so bad. I would say figure it out and then cut it out. The only thing I consume anymore that has any kind of sweetener at all is my protein powders. And that's got stevia. And Equip, for those of you who, who are fans of Equip, um, they have let me know they are working on, they've got some stuff in R and D right now. Don't know when it might, it might hit, but they're looking into using some natural sweeteners. So for those who are more low carb, um, not as concerned with, um, replacing sweeteners, uh, they're looking at things like maple syrup, honey, that kind of a thing. So, um, ultimately, and yes, Christina, I love that you said this. Insulin is not the enemy. Insulin is not the enemy. Guess what we need to build muscle? If you want nutrients to get into your cells, your body has to produce insulin to make that happen. Nutrients. Nutrients are more than just fat. Yes, insulin will shuttle fat into the cells, but it also shuttles all of our nutrients into our cells. So to build muscle, we want 
Insulin, we don't wanna live without any insulin. That would be a problem. We don't need to fear insulin. The problem is hyperinsulinemia. The problem is high blood sugar that doesn't come back down. Excess chronic high blood sugar, that is a problem, okay? So we don't want insulin resistance, but we do want insulin sensitivity. So we don't need to fear anything that's gonna cause our insulin to ever go up because we need that. When we are human beings, we want that, okay? It's a problem for type one diabetics for a reason. I love that. Thank you for saying that. Um, all right, so yeah, so I wouldn't get hung up on these studies, right? I'm, I'm always the person telling you that this is about practicality. This is about, um, I am results-based. I am not evidence-based. I'm not waiting for a study to come out to tell me whether or not something is healthy for my body. And I'm not leaning on studies to justify my poor behaviors and decision-making when it comes to putting things into my body. And I see a lot of people out there doing it. There's no study that says this, so I'm going to keep eating it. Okay. You wait for the study. I'm listening to my body. Okay. So, um, other things that can cause problems for people, some people and, and cause problems for some people and not for others. Added fibers, gums, stabilizers, thickening agents. This is a this is a situation where it would be helpful and I, it would behoove you to when you're looking at products that have these kinds of added gums, acacia fiber, um, guar gum, um, Xanthan gum. Xanthan gum is a major trigger for gut problems for a lot of people. A lot of gastric distress from xanthan gum. I am one of them. I definitely noticed some things with, with xanthan gum. It's one of the reasons why I've stopped using egg life wraps as much as I like them. I don't buy them as often because I know I'm going to deal with a little bit of distress if I consume them. So I avoid xanthan gum. But guar gum or um, what's the other one? Guar gum, there's one other one that um, sometimes it will be in my coconut milks. And that seems to not be a problem for me. Um, acacia fiber or acacia gum is another one that tends to be in a lot of things. These things are natural. All of the ones, the, all of those ones I just mentioned, they are natural. Um, but where they come from and the resins, um, that the gums that they come from, the plants that they come from, it can be a problem for certain people. So it's one of those things um, to look at. But don't necessarily rule them all out. Oh, there's an additive. That means it's bad. You know, just because they put things in to stabilize or thicken something doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be bad and you need to avoid all of those things. Um, but you, it would be helpful to look it up, look where it comes from, because a lot of things are derived from corn. And some of us have serious problems, reactions to corn, anything that's corn derived. And a lot of these things are corn derived. So look up where it comes from. Um, and that may be helpful for you. Um, a lot of these chemicals, we don't have to af be afraid of everything that's a chemical in food, okay? This is another thing where I would say, look it up, look at the flavorings, the colorings, the preservatives, the emulsifiers. I like to avoid anything that has a coloring in it. Um, but natural flavors that have gotten a really bad rap, like, oh my God, natural flavors are not natural. They're synthetic. Um, I'm not concerned about things that have natural flavors in them. I don't know. I mean, maybe you are, that's something you gotta decide on based on your research. Um, but I don't avoid things just because it says it's made with natural flavors. Uh, now, whenever I can find, like one of the things that I, I do consume that has natural flavors is my nut pods, which is the uh, coconut, it does have almond milk. It is an almond milk blend, so I don't always do it, but it's coconut and almond, and they do use natural flavors. And then my sparkling waters, I actually have one in here right now. I like the flavored sparkling waters. Sometimes I find the natural, the, the, the flavored sparkling waters that are actually essenced or essence of a fruit, and it's not it's not natural flavors. It's the actual 
whatever lemon essence or something of that nature. And some of them even use like the lemon oil and things like that. So that's kind of cool. Whenever I find one like that, I like to get the essence ones rather than the ones with natural flavors. But I don't go out of my way to avoid natural flavors. Um, this is a good comment right here from Erin, who I know really, y'all, if anybody is celiac or really cares deeply about gluten, holler at Erin, gluten-free coach. Uh, she said natural flavors sometimes have gluten. So that's something really important that you may not know. Ah, this was the other one I was trying to remember the name of, the gel and gum um, in heavy cream. That's another thing. I would look up where's gel, gel and gum come from. That was the other one. I was like, guar gum and gel and gum are the two that I see the most in like the, the coconut products. Um, and it is usually in heavy cream. Um, that might be something that, number one, look it up. Look where it's derived from. Notice if you already know you have reactions to that. Um, if not, something to test out. Notice if you see anything, if you notice anything different. And this is why I say being observant of your body is the key. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be afraid of anything, but test it out. Do you notice anything? Don't change anything else. If you're testing something, you want to keep everything else the same, like literally the same, the same foods that you eat all the time and you change one thing. You know, if you consume heavy cream regularly, buy one with a gel and gum, test it out for a week, see if you notice anything. You know, that's that's the best way to figure that out. But I would check it first just to make sure you're not, you don't already know you're allergic to what it's derived from. And then uh, th this is where I was going with the chemicals thing. You will see some products that have a bunch of chemicals in them. And if you look them up, if you look up the chemicals, you will see that it is a vitamin. It is just a name for a vitamin. So some vitamin fortified foods look like they have this laundry list of dangerous, scary chemicals, and it's just vitamin A, vitamin, you know, it'll just have all the different vitamins, but they're using the chemical names. So look it up if you're not familiar with it, and then it'll help answer your question about whether or not you should put it in your body. I will say that we don't want to be getting our vitamins from fortified foods. It would be better to get them from the foods in their natural uh, state and whatever we can't get from our foods. If we need to supplement, then I always talk about supplementing with what we know we need, getting our testing done, figuring out what we're low in and what we need and what we have enough of and not just buying things because they're fortified with vitamins. Um, I see this a lot with milks and non-dairy milks is that they like to add a bunch of vitamins to it, but it doesn't mean you need to necessarily be afraid of it. Um, cool. I think that's all I really had here. Ultimately, the takeaway is research, understand what you're putting in your body and then make an educated decision about whether or not you're going to consume that thing. Um, don't just let the keto carnivore gurus tell you what to be afraid of, because there is there's a lot of fear mongering out there. Um, but at the same time, check yourself and check your own justifications and what you might be trying to justify because your limbic brain is trying to rule the show. So Basically, what I always say is don't shop your health out. Don't shop your decisions out to somebody else. Own your journey. Do the research. And then if you come across something and you're still unsure after you've done the research, drop into the Facebook group in the Keto Bikini Secrets Facebook group. Or if, if you're in the academy, you can always ask us that question in our forums um, and we will help you make that decision for yourself. Um, but I really like you know, the, the tuning in. Um, perfect. Look at that. Bless you are just aligned with where I'm going. Tuning into your body and your own signals and your own reactions. If you're not feeling great, could be something you're consuming. Usually it's going to be the extras, the sauces, the thing you bought that you, you don't normally buy because it looked good and you wanted to try it. You know, uh, maybe you missed an ingredient you didn't, you didn't notice, right? It's usually not going to be the real foods that we eat all the time. Um, so it can be easy to kind of pinpoint those things. At the end of the day, though, too, 
you can still catch a virus. You still can get a bacterial infection. You still can get things that impact your health that are not from what you're eating. So I don't want you to feel afraid and obsessive over everything that's happening in your body must be because of what you consumed, because that's not always the case. You know, I think I had somebody recently in the group who, who got sick and it was like, I was trying to figure out, you know, what the heck I was eating or what I did. And then, oh yeah, it was, it was Isabel. Um, and then it was her kid picked up something at school and the family got it. It's like, yeah, it wasn't even anything that she did. So we don't want to make ourselves completely crazy, you know, stressing out about what we're consuming. But at the same time, when we're making solid choices on a regular basis, we don't have to stress out over what we're consuming. Now, when we're excusing away and justifying things all the time, then it can make us paranoid and stressed and that's stressful to the body. And now the body can react to the stress that we're creating for ourselves. So let that be another reason to stay on plan, follow the way of eating that you chose, get back to that. Why, why am I eating the way I'm eating? Why did I choose this? Because I could choose a different diet. And boom, I'm going to leave this up here as we end because that is the takeaway message always. Own your journey. Be the CEO of your body. And with that, I am well over an hour, almost an hour and a half tonight. I knew I was going to go on and on tonight because this is a juicy topic. Um, but that's all I have for you tonight. I will see y'all inside the Facebook group for those of you in there. And for those of you on YouTube, I will see you next week on our next masterclass. Or you can tune in on Bronson's YouTube for our weekly coffee chat this weekend and on my Instagram live if you're IG peeps. So I love y'all. Keep doing your thing, owning your journey, doing your thing, crushing it. And I'll see y'all on the interwebs. Good night.